Welcome back to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today, I'll be joined by director Caleb J. Phillips, who directed the super creepy short film called Other Side of the Box that you might have seen me talking about on here already, or maybe you've already seen the short film yourself, which is free here on YouTube because that film originally aired in 2018. So without further ado, here's Caleb. So Caleb, thank you for being here. I am super pumped to talk a little bit more about you and Other Side of the Box and what you got coming up. Uh, so if you could please start by just giving me and the listeners a little bit of your background as a filmmaker and, you know, maybe where you're based out of that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Happy to be here. I'm in Los Angeles right now. I've been here for seven years. I'm from Northern California, a town called Redding, and shot a bunch of terrible skits when I was a kid growing up uh, around 2015. I, I made a very, very okay low budget feature. I like started out wanting to be a cinematographer. Uh, the director I was shooting this feature on dropped out. I stepped up to direct, to direct, excuse me. I realized that I wanted to do that a lot more than DP. So I moved back to LA and yeah, I've always just kind of been a self-producer, self-financer. Everything I do is done from that point of view. Uh, when I moved back to LA, I was in a real creative rut. And that's when I made the box and yeah, then got caught up with managers and festivals and then the pandemic happened and now I'm here. It's about as concise as I can put it. It's funny that you did this film before uh, the pandemic, because it seems like a perfect film for during the pandemic, uh, just because of the minimalist nature of it, how you don't need very many people, you don't need any locations other than you could do it in someone's house. It is funny. Yeah, no, I do see that. But I mean, like, that's always just like the staple of low budget court. Like I have a, a bunch of other like filmmaker director friends and it's always that it's like, what is the location we can use for free? What is a concept that's very inexpensive? It's the reason everyone goes towards tour uh, because it like rewards uh, innovation with limitations. And yeah, the basic, like the box idea wasn't even meant to be in a house. It was like this image I had of a head poking out of water, like traveling down a river. And uh, that's the first thing you do is put it in a house. You're like, what can we do for a few thousand dollars because we're barely keeping ourselves alive in LA, but we have to fund this ourselves. You said for a few thousand dollars, because that was one of the things I wanted to ask you, because I feel like it's always uh, super inspiring for people like me or any uh, aspiring filmmakers or filmmakers just waiting to break through, like hearing about what can be achieved for how much, because the other side of the box is one of the best short or other side of the box is one of the best short films I've ever seen. I mean, I, I'm still pretty creeped out about it. I watched it twice and, you know, I'm struggling to look at boxes the same. So was that like the budget for the film was just a couple thousand? Yeah, it was 3000. It was, wow. uh, I was for free, all the crew for below minimum wage, which I don't do that anymore, but a lot of favors called it a lot of favors. Uh, yeah. Camera, a weekend rental, like all of it added up to about 3000. I split it in between me and my um, co-writer, the star and co-producer Nick Tag. And it was too little money. Um, we shot about like 45 setups a day in this house, like just writing a mental breakdown the entire time. It was too many shots, too little time. Definitely needed more money. Uh, I'm really glad it turned out the way it did, but yeah, 3000 was way too little for, for that project. See, it's funny when you say 45 setups in, in the single day. I think a lot of people who haven't tried making a film themselves don't understand like how hard it is just to do a new setup like it even if you just move slightly you might have to rework the entire lighting setup and hide things that were uh previously out of frame that are now in frame Man, at a certain point the math doesn't add up you're you like look at how much time you spent how much how many shots there are left you know? and i just remember turning to nick and being like i we can't I'm not gonna be able to do this like we just there is literally not enough time in the day somehow we did i don't really remember how but yeah, uh, I've um, in terms of setups, like that all goes to my DP, Laura Jansen. Like from the beginning, we knew it was going to be too many setups to like complete on a normal shooting schedule. So what we did is we pre lit the set with like lamps and it was like a china ball and like just like a Ari Sweeney. And uh, it was basically the, the 
idea was like five to 10 minutes a setup, like in between each setup, one to two takes, go just, and like, if we were taking too long, we just had to settle for what the shot was. Like it was like that great neck. Were you guys only allowed to do the one day based on the budget? Yeah, well, it was two days in a house and it was based okay. on the fact that we just couldn't afford like wages and food just on, when you're on a low budget, short, like that's what really goes up. Um, and like we're renting a lot of gear and in LA, I don't know about other places, but in LA you get a one day rental for a weekend. So you rent a red camera and if it's over Saturday and Sunday, it only charges you one day. So like our entire budget was predicated on doing it in two days. Dang. So I wanted to ask you this because if I don't, I think the people, um, on the internet will form a mob and probably come and get me. I never watched Doctor Who. I'm sure you've seen these comments a million times. Uh, was any part of the story inspired by the weeping angels from Doctor Who? Not the story. Um, what it came down to is at the very beginning, I had the head poking out of the box, the situation. I knew I wanted there to be a twist, but it all came down to, well, why doesn't the thing just get out of the box now? And then I kind of came back to and big Doctor Who fan. I totally fucking stole it. I mean, that and like Mario with the Boo Ghosts. But um, yeah, and that's why it was so important to like make the twist a play on that rule because anyone who had seen the Weeping Angels, like it wasn't going to be enough to do a one-to-one -one copy of it. And I'm like, okay, like can we play with the expectation of, oh, you just look at it and it can't move. And that being the reveal that no, it's just the person who's given the box. Um, but yeah, definitely Weeping Angels was the leaping off point for the rule. Back when you had that idea of a head poking out of a river, was it still kind of like this jumping off point, like where you were thinking of Weeping Angels? Or did that uh, come into your head after you decide, all right, it's got to be a box? After it was a box. Like, what is keeping it in the box? Yeah, I mean, when it's like in a river, like I always just start with images and... I just really trust my guts like and that image of like having something staring at me poking out of like an abyss or water or looking in through a window at night when you're home alone uh that i knew was really really unsettling uh yeah honestly all the rules including the mimicking as well it's all just a way to i guess keep the pace up like the core of the idea is the image but the rules just kind of thrown in there to just make the suspense work. I'm curious, are you, uh, cause I know you also co-wrote this and some people like to leave it up to interpretation. So if I asked you, how does inside the box work? Is that something that you're open to? Because my question is after he opens the box, it seems like it takes the character a little while to surface. And mm -hmm. also, you know, he's dripping wet. Um, so was he in the river? Like, is there a bit of ways to get before you can surface to the top? Have you thought about those things? I have thought about those things. Yeah, and, and I think the reason why most people, including myself, don't don't give direct answers is because it then uh, removes all the other possibilities. Like, I know what's on the other side. I know what the rules are. But not being able to nail it down, I think adds to the fear so much more than just like a head poking out of a box. For me, what just grabbed me was there was a terror in reality and something on the outside was looking in. There's always been an element of water to it. There's something about birth and something that's precious that we as human beings need kind of being perverted in a different way. That was really interesting to me. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's a, it goes very far down. I think that uh, it's a lot of space down there. Would it be safe to assume that their mission is to drag you into the box? Is that the girlfriend gone? <laughs> One of them? Yeah. Uh, I don't really want to say because yeah. if I ever do something more with it, there was something I wanted to do that doesn't, doesn't exclude um, more than just capturing people. So I, just, I didn't want it to be like a zombie thing. Like we get people in other box monsters, which is what mm -hmm. we call them. Yeah, so that's about as much as I can answer. Okay, glad to hear it's kind of open-ended. Do you want to make a feature film, a full-length feature film for this? Oh yeah, I would love to. Um, the problem I keep running into is I think the version I want to, it's, it's weirder than I think mm -hmm. the version that most people want to see. Like I think that people who can make movies happen want to see the It Follows version of the box. Yeah. And that just hasn't been 
what grabbed me, what grabbed me about the box was how strange it was. So I think that, yes, 100% want to, I have not found a way in to allow me to do the really weird version of it. With the success of the short film, so right now it's got 12 million views on that YouTube channel that it's on. Does that not uh, give you kind of more budget power when you're looking for people to invest in the film? This is like the biggest um, hard pill to swallow that I had to swallow over the course of the pandemic. Like, I feel like the, the, um, the Sandberg lights out um, road of like, you make a short, it's super successful. Everyone wants to make the movie. I feel like that's, um, those are outliers. I know so many filmmakers with incredibly successful shorts that cannot get their foot in the door. I think that it helps you get managers. I think it helps you get collaborators and get meetings which is really important like you have a script and it's really nice to be able to know that like i can get almost any meeting i want it doesn't really change the fact that you are a first-time filmmaker in this in this space like it doesn't mean that someone thinks that they know they can trust a million dollars to you to deliver and that you can put together a 90-minute thing that's going to be a crowd please are really successful so it helps a lot it doesn't get you all the way there basically in order for you to get a budget it's got to be a crowd pleaser it can't be too weird no crazy fever dream like movie i think that like it really depends on the budget too i think that like the lower it is the lower the risk the higher the chance to do that yeah and you know going back to that earlier question i'll be completely honest it's also because while i do have the weirder version like there are other stories i think i can tell better i think that when I was putting together what I would like to do for the box, I liked it a lot, but it didn't feel as special to me as the short was. Whereas other feature film ideas and other scripts I've written, like those like boil my blood, those get me going. Um, and I have to trust my gut because my gut led me to the box. And yeah, that's the best thing I have. So yeah, I, I think that I have, I'd love to do it someday, but there are, I think, more interesting stories I can tell. Are those uh, other scripts that you've written a similar genre? Yes. Yeah. They're all either horror or psychological suspense. Um, they're all very paranoid, usually a mystery, usually with a twist. Um, awesome. Yeah, I've got a few scripts. Hopefully next year I'm going to be shopping around this one I really want to make. I spent this year writing like a feature film that could probably be made for like quite a little bit amount of money, like like really cheap and very suspenseful. I think it's got a great ending and I might do some sort of fundraiser. This is just me plugging now. I might do some sort of fundraiser um, early next year for it. Um, but yeah, they're all very similar in tone. Like if you like the box and if you like my next short film, you'll probably like these movies. Nice. Your next short film, that one is currently uh, in like the festival circuit? Yeah, it is finishing it up. It is going to be released April on the same YouTube channels as The Box is. So all certain short of the week in April. Uh, it's called Play Me. Yeah, it's about this woman who wakes up in the middle of nowhere with no memory and a man tied up in the back seat. She finds a tape recorder with her voice on it telling her that she has to do something really bad this man and the man wakes up and tells her a completely different story so it's very much like a gaslighting back and forth i don't know what to believe uh situation so that will be out in april on alters youtube channel i wanted to ask you yep. about that youtube channel what's that relationship like do you know the person is it a channel that you really want to get uh your film on or did they reach out to you and ask to license your film so back with the box they reached out after south by southwest to license it i like Alter for the week a lot but the and i i know a few of the people over there um but mostly it's just they have submissions you can just submit your film and um so for the week i submitted the box for like a 25 dollar fee and they accepted it it's basically like what happened um i think you want to get on those youtube channels i've seen a lot of success from um, filmmakers who have their own personal youtube channels but for me i'm trying to stack the deck a lot of these youtube channels the algorithm likes them they have a built-in audience like even the worst movie can get like forty-five thousand views so um yeah that's 
my thinking with the box and that's my thinking with this next one. Right. And that's got to be pretty rewarding making a short film and being able to just display it to that amount of people, whether it's 12 million individual people for every view right now, or if everyone's like me and watch it twice and six people or six million people who are just on fire about the film, you know, that's really cool. Did you anticipate this film getting that kind of viewership not when remotely. you were making it? Not remotely. Uh, when I put it online in 2020, I remember I was staying with my parents and I was like, dude, dad, if this can get a hundred thousand views, it was just like, that was my thinking. And then I got a hundred thousand views. I was like, oh fuck, if I could get a million. Cause like, I've never like had any sort of online success before. So a million was like, way out there as a pipe dream um you know anticipate it all if i didn't anticipate it if i knew it was going to happen i probably would have put it on my personal youtube channel because the challenge is now how do you tell all the people who like the box that are on this youtube channel that kayla phillips is doing another film because like i don't have a youtube channel connected to that so that's a bit of a challenge but no i didn't anticipate it at all can you not work it into uh the agreement to like have your like your own channel plugged at the bottom or something like that you you absolutely can do that yeah okay. um i didn't have a youtube channel with the box i will with play me um yeah and i will most likely do some sort of director commentary like on both of them and try mm -hmm. to pull a bit of the audience to my youtube channel my head's just right now like focused on like how do i find people who love the box who might be interested in me be like supporting like the next project I'm doing? well uh, being on here is a good start. Hopefully yeah. all the movie yeah, fans Clyde will Baker. yeah, come and support and, uh, you know, like fund your next film. Was it always successful? Has it been like a steady climb of views? Does it randomly pick up in popularity? Within like six months, I think it went to 3 million mm. and then it just like stayed there for a while. And I would say like every like six months, it'll like bump a few million. It's usually just like some creator, whether it be TikTok or Instagram reels will um showcase it and then that will bring in a flood of new um audience members who haven't seen it uh, but yeah no i noticed over the last two or three years like it's just been this resurgence where like one of my friends or collaborators will hit me up and be like hey just like boosted another million i was like oh shit, i'm not exactly sure why and then somebody will send me a reel and i'm like oh it's this creator like that's why this happened or this live stream it's kind of crazy what the internet can do now uh speaking of people making those videos uh what's your opinion when someone spoils your movie in uh one of those types of videos where they talk about it promote it i don't mind it because these aren't movies in a movie theater um mm. one of my really good friends really encouraged me to put the thumbnail of the box in uh, head of the box in the thumbnail of the youtube thing and for me like at first i resisted it and then i did it and i'm like i'm pretty sure the box wouldn't have half the views if i just did a shot of a closed box or a shot of the title or whatever um so when people spoil it in my mind the people who i want to be really really surprised have already seen it and the people who would have never watched it without it being spoiled wouldn't have seen it so I don't mind a whole lot. Honestly, it's just about getting as many people to see it as possible um, because that can only help me. The way I found out about it was my uh, youngest sister, she's a freshman in high school, sent me a reel uh, from a, a woman talking about it. And I, I can't really remember if it uh, spoiled anything. It was kind of like walking through some of the stuff that happens in there. I don't think it gave everything away. Um, it didn't feel like it took away from my experience at all. And it was the imagery of the man in the box. I was like, I need to see this. <laughs> I need to see this. I know, man. And oh, it's just like, and see, this is what I think can drive filmmakers insane. It's like, now all you think about is like, oh, well, like, how do I get there again? <laughs> how do I, how do I find that imagery again? So I'm trying not to think too much about that, but yeah, man, like just that image, like, cause like going into it, I wasn't trying to make a horror film. Like I thought, I didn't know the head was going to be as scary as it was, um, which is why the characters don't call the cops, which in hindsight, I feel like they should. But <laughs> like when I, when I found the head in the box, I was like, oh, this would be like really strange. Like, but I'm like, no, people scream. Like when I went to the festivals, people in the theater screamed when I showed up. So trying to prioritize imagery, especially in shorter projects without without being too um, superficial about trying to like reverse engineer ideas. So I was watching this movie and then I thought in my head, man, Alice in Chains' Man in the Box is going to play differently in my head. 
And I listened to it the other day. And then I was like, holy fuck, like, did he actually use any of this song to, you know, make the film? Because the lyrics are like oddly similar to the film. I don't even know if I've heard that song, but what are the lyrics? You've probably heard the song. Uh, right. once you, once I'm, you I'm from hear a small it. town. I've definitely yeah. heard Alex and Chase. The lyrics are, I'm the man in the box, buried in my shit. Uh, the clean version says pit. And then it says, won't you come and save me, save me. And then like in the main hook, it says, feed my eyes. Can you sew them shut? One person says, feed my eyes. And then in like the background vocals, it's like, can you sew them shut? So it sounds like a, com a conversation between like the person looking at the box and the person who's in the box who wants to get out so then it says feed my eyes i've never understood what that meant but i was like oh maybe it's like kind of like feast your eyes on you know what you see so like feed my eyes like this person wants to or like needs to watch the thing it says can you sew them shut and then it says jesus christ so this being the person out of the box looking down and then the backup vocal says deny your maker and it just sounds super evil like it's trying to get you to close your eyes you know, like give in to evil and whatnot. I was like, holy fuck, this just happens to be, or I'm reading way too much in it. No, uh, I mean, I definitely didn't like um, know this song prior to this moment, unless I like hear the melody, but I love the idea of if I ever do anything else in the universe, just using that song. Cause that's fucking, <laughs> that's really creepy. Like those are some really creepy lyrics. It's really funny, the coincidence there, <laughs> the, it yeah. just kind of matches up. <laughs> Since you were one of the writers, can I ask you, is this intentional foreshadowing in the very beginning when they're cooking and they're kind of messing around and the girlfriend's like, oh, you're getting me wet? Because that feels like foreshadowing for when <laughs> the the wet dude comes out of the box. I'm going to be real with you. Like, I'm like, I always cringe at the first 60 minutes. Like, I really... I was much better writer when it came to structure than I was dialogue. I'm much better now. I, I just knew that we needed a sequence of them being normal, be normal before the box shows up. So no, no. If I had, if I had my way, I would, I would rewrite that scene. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's funny. Well, <laughs> accidental foreshadowing, so it can't be that bad. I, I've been asking directors now, kind of like strategic filmmaking questions. So if you had to only choose one of these for one of the upcoming films you're gonna shoot, would it be you could only use one prime lens or you had to edit the film into a square format or you could only use stationary tripod shots so not even panning or anything like that or you could only shoot in full HD. I feel like I'm in between stationary and square format because the, the next film play me is um, four by three, so pretty close to square. Um, I really like the idea of stationary tripod quite a bit. I've always wanted to do that. I think uh, some of my favorite filmmakers like often like have shots that play really well in these very like geometrical lines, like Yogos Lanthimos and a lot of Sam Esmail's stuff in Mr. Robot. Um, I'd probably really like to explore that because I, I always feel like really insecure that like, I need to get in there and get a few close-ups um, so the audience can really feel some of these bigger emotions. I've never really tried um, having some bigger emotions play out in very stationary shots. I mean, obviously you can block people close to the camera, which is also really fun. Um, oh, you know what? I actually have DP to short that is all stationary like that. It's really fun. So yeah, that's my choice. If you were to do that, would you still stick with kind of like this horror psychological thriller thing? Like, would it be pretty difficult to do that with horror? I don't think so. I think that um, it's probably difficult to do like surprises. Like if mm -hmm. you like cutting into a close-up or pushing into a close-up. No, I think it's like a different kind of suspense. I think that it'd be a different kind of horror. For me, it'd be a lot closer to funny games where there's a tension of like, impending violence in a space in like this wide shot like one person might hurt another person and like people moving around the frame and moving closer and farther away i think that like it would be more it'd be less surprising but i think that you can make something very scary yeah 
it's it's super cool when um can be done effectively so with the box and the the head coming out is that practical or is that visual effects it's, it's practical in a 20 dollar table off of craigslist we cut a square hole in it we took a long time to find the box mm -hmm. um because most of them are too tall mm -hmm. but yeah it is a person under the table and then the interior of the box is spray painted black mm. and then enhanced with the effect. So I just flip all the shadows. But yeah, it is as practical as like it could be. One big thing for me, and I really want to keep this going, is that if something looks impossible, it's even more important that it is real. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted it to feel like something that sort of breaks your brain, that like you do not think for a moment it's fake that it feels like it's really there, but also looks impossible. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it would look terrible if I tried to do it with the effects. Yeah, yeah, on the second time I watched it, I started laughing because I was like, I guarantee you that man's just sitting in a table, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. like sticking his head out. The idea of that is really funny. And I was gonna ask you about how you made the, the box so dark if you just had masks and you were just crushing the shadows or the yep. blacks. Gotcha, that's cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure if maybe you just had like a, kind of like a black solid and we're rotoscoping out people's hands when it would go over. But the shadows definitely seems like it'd be easier. Oh yeah. For, for the shot looking down whenever he drops the pencil, it's like an interior like box black. And then we take a bunch of doobie team going down so we can actually drop it down. But yeah, uh, anytime you see black, like there's actual black there. So are you uh, working on a new film since that one is, you know, already in that circuit and is going to be coming out in April? These shorts take so long to make that um, for me, the qualifications is I have to be able to like do pre-production like two months. I, I can't, I can't like have my whole year devoted to making the short, but yeah, I'll probably do another short and then try to get into production on this next feature, which I'm really excited about. Right. That's the same one that you're saying uh, the budget probably shouldn't need to be that high for you to achieve. Yeah. I, it's sort of like my, I've just spent so much time trying to get larger films off the ground, like above 1 million and gotten frustrated, like gotten so close and then still not made it that I just wanted to make a basically a fuck you project. Like, Hey, I can like, I can make this for almost nothing and it will be like a c-minus movie or i can make it for like a few hundred thousand and it'll be like a a plus movie like I, it's something that can be made for very little money like films that inspire me are like freak and coherence and frightener movies that like these guys with really cool ideas just went out and shot something and didn't wait for permission because that's what I did with Box, and I feel like it worked out. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do with this next one. When you are making the budget for the film, like how long does that take? Or, and what do you have to take into consideration beyond like just your own pay and locations? For this project in particular, it's all about um, tax incentives mostly, um, and then crew. Because I know all the crew I would need to make it here but I have some people who help produce play me on the East coast who have a lot of resources and a lot of free locations. So for me, like it's balancing, like, can we get locations for free? And then how does that balance with like housing, like putting through up how much local hire are you going to get? Um, yeah. How long are you going to be out there? Do you have a special effects resources like companies or do you need to fly them out? Um, also considering Amsterdam and Mexico for it um, because of tax incentives and just local resources. So it's really just about kind of pulling the trigger on what is the biggest chunk of your budget that can be gotten for either like free or very inexpensive and then does that balance with all the other resources needed to get us there. Are the tax incentives enough to kind of like counteract plus some for the cost of like travel and lodging and all that? once you're there with a the whole crew? They should, but it's so speculative because you don't know if you're going to get them. So you're like banking on getting them. And then if you don't, that means you're not going to be able to afford the transportation and the housing and all that. Um, but yeah, no, like it's quite a, a chunk of your budget that you can get back. So yeah, it's sort of just like you create these plans, like here's the Amsterdam plan, here's the Mexico plan. And like, if this is a go, then like, this is the move. Like it will suddenly be all local grip and electric and local art department and local special effects. 
um, or this, like it's Mexico's close enough that we're going to just drive everyone down or yeah. So it's, it's a bit, but I'm still kind of educating myself on it. I'm not as educated on it as I should be. Your story, it doesn't matter if it's in Mexico or if it's in Amsterdam, like it could be anywhere. With this polished draft, um, I was, I started to realize, I'm like, oh, I don't need this to be location specific. It has a very, um, um, new married couple with the baby moves to a new place and something um, supernatural happens. And I started to realize, I'm like, oh, like actually having an outside perspective of Americans going somewhere they're not used to in a culture that is um, foreign actually helps a lot with this sort of like dark fairy tale like tone it has. Um, But yeah, as I've been doing the new draft, I've realized that, oh, I actually don't need the father to be the father it can just be like a guy they know and then suddenly that opens up opportunities because like just to go into a spiel real fast um like i wrote it so the house didn't have to be geographically specific like what got me in trouble with the box was that i needed like a hole for him to get trapped in which means that we had to find that so going into this i wanted to be as broad as i possibly possibly could be one story house two story house it look like anything, be anything, and same thing for like the location. Could this be anywhere? And I think it, I think it can. Do you find that as the writing process goes on, and the longer you sit on a film, the more you're able to kind of like chisel it down to where it can work with anything? Is that like a common thing that happens for you, or is it just kind of this story specifically? Usually, kind of. It, it, it's mostly the story specifically. Um, in the chiseling down of it, I do. Is, that's my favorite part. That's when I start to realize I'm like, oh wow, like these scenes could be way scarier with a tiny tweet. But, but yeah, I mostly just walk away from a script for like two months, and then it just kind of inevitably happens that I find like cheaper ways to do things because I'm so afraid of low budget filmmaking because I know how hard it is that like I'm always trying to think like, is there an easier way? to do this thing. When you walk away from a script for that long, do you ever feel like you're just not interested in it anymore? Do you have a script graveyard on your computer? I not really. I haven't been writing for very long. I probably have been writing for four years and I only have like three finished scripts. Mostly what happens is I wonder if there's a way I can make it better. But the one I was shopping around that's like over a million, I've been lately based off of what I've learned from writing this new script, I've been wondering if there's a better version of an old script. And so for you to write a script, like the one that you're going to shop around, how long does that take? I want to say like two drafts were like six months. I really wish it was faster, but I'm also working a part-time job. If you don't mind me asking, what's your part-time job? I do grip and electric. I like key grip commercial. Okay. It is a great job. I love it. It's just light and shampoo bottles. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sell my soul to the corporate overlords to get uh, a paycheck. But it's but it's, what's great about it is it's part time. Like I'm able to work like a few days a week and then have free time to just write. And mm-hmm. I just don't know if I'd be able to do what I'm doing if I like worked a full time job. Well, and at least it's it's basically the same industry. You know, it's not mm-hmm. like it may be shampoo bottles, but you're still working with like film lights and you know all all that kind of stuff. Oh, and yeah. you can you can practice that stuff there, and you might even. I, I don't know how often it would happen with uh, shampoo or anything like that, but might meet people who are also interested in the same thing who could turn out to be a good connection and a good relationship. And that's what happened. Like everyone who worked on the, the next film, Play Me, like they are all people I've worked with who came out who, who came out for very little money, who are worth three times the money that wanted to help me that I met working. Yeah, that that's cool. That seems like, um, at least, you know, in that short film realm, like you really need those relationships, like the people who will ride for you and also who want to, you know, get a portfolio of their own, like be in a mm-hmm. short film, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on here. It was great to pick your brain. And if people want to follow you or subscribe to that YouTube channel, where can they find you? Okay, so the films are going to be on Alter channel on youtube and my instagram is caleb.j.phillips uh yeah i don't have a ton of social media presence that's about it i will probably start a youtube channel i will probably upload some director commentaries uh yeah so i guess stay tuned well thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your insights on the film and i'm excited to check out play me thank you so much